Welcome back to 13 Cubed. So here's a question for you. What software do you prefer to mount disk images on a Windows box? I've used FTK Imager for years, and that's what you've seen me use in various episodes within the Introduction to Windows Forensic series. But in this episode, we're going to take a look at a much more modern alternative called Arsenal Image Mounter from Arsenal Recon. You're looking at the product website now, and as of the recording of this episode, the very newest major version, 3, was just released. Reading from the developer's site, the software mounts the contents of disk images as complete disks in Windows. It includes a virtual SCSI adapter, which allows users to benefit from disk-specific features in Windows, like integration with Disk Manager, access to volume shadow copies, and more. As far as Windows is concerned, the contents of disk images mounted by Arsenal Image Mounter are real SCSI disks. Now, the software is available for free, however, not all of the features will be activated. You can purchase a subscription, as you see here, and actually gain access to all of Arsenal's tools, including Arsenal Image Mounter, or AIM as it's often referred to. When you do so, you'll enable the professional mode of the tool and be able to mount volume shadow copies and have additional functionality. And speaking of functionality, let's go ahead and take a look at the major features of AIM, specifically those that were either added or enhanced in version 3. When you mount an NTFS image or a volume shadow copy, you'll now have the option to choose Mount with Windows File System Driver Bypass. This tells AIM to not use the normal NTFS file system driver that ships with Windows, but to instead use the third-party Disk Utils library to bypass built-in system security. This has the advantage of exposing those hidden NTFS meta files, which include things like the MFT, log file, and USN journal. There is also support for the new Advanced Forensics File Format 4, or AFF4. And there's a new native write filter that enables temporary writing or write overlays for all supported image file formats. There's a new Save as New Image File feature, which will enable you to mount one image type and then, including the deltas, write that out to a different image file format, such as DD, VHD, VHDX, etc. And then, of course, one of the most powerful features of AIM has always been the ability to launch a VM from a disk image. And now it's even more powerful. This does require Windows 8, 8.1, or 10, or Server 2012, 2012R2, 2012 or 2016, 64-bit, alongside the Hyper-V role running on physical, not virtual, hardware. This will spin up a Hyper-V VM from the disk image. And one of the neat new things now is something called AIM Virtual Machine Tools. Think of it kind of like VMware tools, but not exactly. This gets injected into Windows VMs and made available to us through the Ease of Access icon on the login screen. And in case you forgot what that looked like, that's the icon you're looking at now in the bottom right of your screen. All right, so what does it do? Well, this enables us the ability to reset the password of each active user account and also add them to the local administrators group. It can also open an administrative command prompt directly from the login screen prior to login, which is really awesome. Virtual machine launching from MBR and GPT disks has now been greatly improved, and you can even inject MBRs, bootloaders, and more as necessary. And you can launch the same disk image mounted multiple times in multiple VMs to facilitate parallel testing and analysis. And then lastly, even though we're not actually going to look at this in the demo, there's something called aim underscore CLI, which of course is the command line version written in .NET 4, that provides most of the features of the aim GUI version. And there's also an aim underscore LL that is the low level version of Arsenal Image Mounter that does not use .NET and provides a more low level access to the aim driver. Again, we won't actually be looking at these two utilities in the live demo, but I did want you to know that they're present. So with all this out of the way, let's go ahead and hop over to a Windows 10 machine and take a look at this tool in action. Welcome to Arsenal Image Mounter. If this is your first time seeing the software, I think you'll agree that the interface is very clean and easy to understand. Along the bottom of the window, only two of the options are currently enabled, Mount Disk Image and Refresh, and that's of course because the other options are dependent upon an image being currently mounted. Let's click Mount Disk Image, and you'll notice that we have an E drive listed here, which is an external drive connected to this VM. 
On it, I have a DD, an EO1, and a VHDX image. By the way, the VHDX was created with CAPE, and on a Windows 10 box, we could just double click on it to have the operating system mount it read-write. However, with Arsenal Image Mounter, we could mount it read-only if we wanted to. We're going to be sticking with the EO1 for this part of the demo, so let's go ahead and choose it, and then we'll see the image mount options. The default option is read-only disk device, which uses the built-in NTFS drivers to mount the image in read-only state, but does not allow us to have access to the NTFS meta files. Write temporary disk device creates a write overlay and allows us to pretend to modify the mounted image, but doesn't actually change anything. Write original disk device, if this were a DD image, would be enabled, and if we had selected that, that would allow us to actually change the contents of the mounted image, which we probably wouldn't often want to do. And Windows File System Driver Bypass will use that third-party driver to allow us access to the NTFS meta files. We can change the sector size, and we can also emulate a USB thumb drive for images containing partitions instead of complete disk images. Let's stick with the defaults and click OK. So we've now successfully mounted the image, and if we expand this, we can see that the mount point is F colon. We'll also notice the disk size, the read-write status, and various other information. Let's go ahead and switch over to the disk management feature of Windows, and you'll notice this shows up as a 200 gig read-only NTFS volume, as if it were completely physically attached to the computer, just like any other drive. So let's go ahead and minimize this and take a look at the actual drive by going to F colon. And as you can see, it looks like a normal file system. We can traverse through the user directories and everything looks exactly like we would expect, exactly like a drive directly connected to this computer. So pretty neat. That was just a plain, simple demo using the default options to mount the EO1, which contained an NTFS file system. So now let's try something a little bit different. Let's go back to mount disk image. We'll choose the EO1 again, but this time let's go ahead and choose that Windows File System Driver Bypass, which uses the Disk Utils libraries. So we'll click OK, and I've sped this section up because it does take a minute or so for this to cache the directory structure. But when it's done, we'll actually see another line item added here, and we can go ahead and expand both of these, and you'll notice this mount point is now G colon and we'll see various other information related to the image. If we switch over here, you'll notice though this shows up as a CD-ROM because that's how the Disk Utils driver actually presents it to the operating system. So it doesn't show up as an NTFS volume and it's G colon. Let's go ahead and minimize this and take a look at G colon and see what we have. And as you can immediately see, we see those dollar files and directories which are those NTFS meta files including the MFT, and if we go into extend here, there's the USN journal and the $J alternate data stream. So everything looks like it's there, and it does indeed provide access to the NTFS meta files as promised. So that's extremely handy and pretty neat to see how it presents itself to the operating system and how it differs from the standard NTFS driver. So now let's look at mount VSCs. So we again have the option of choosing the built-in driver or the third-party driver. We'll stick with the built-in, and we'll go ahead and create a mount point on the desktop called VSS Test one This is the location in which the directory symbolic links that will allow us to access the shadows should be created. And there they are. So if we click on the first one, this is the first shadow, and this will be a complete copy of the disk as seen via this shadow. And of course, the same holds true for the second one, which is another complete copy of the disk from the second shadow. So no big deal here. There are a number of different ways to do this, including ways built into the operating system, or you can use VSC mount from Eric Zimmerman or various other tools. But this time, let's use that third party library. So we'll choose this option and we'll create a different mount point on the desktop called VSS test two. Now, like the first time we used this driver, it will have to create a directory structure cache, and it's going to do this twice, once for each shadow. So I've greatly increased the speed on this so we don't have to sit here and wait on it. It did take several minutes, and of course that will vary greatly depending on the size of the image. But when it's done, we should once again see this window pop up, and we still have those same directory symbolic links, but this time, check it out. Now we can immediately see that we have directories and files prefixed with the dollar sign. 
So we do have those hidden NTFS meta files exposed to us, just like that, just like we did when we mounted the other image. So again, very, very easy to choose the other option and expose the meta files within volume shadows as well. Notice we also have the save as new image file. This does warn us that the disk is currently online and we can say yes here to take it offline, but we can take this mounted EO1 and then save it out to a different format. So for example, we could save the EO1 as a DD image or a VHD or VHDX or some other format. In fact, if we click on the dropdown here, you can see those available formats. We'll go ahead and choose, how about just DD? I'm not actually going to do this because it will take quite a while, but I just want you to know that this is what I was referring to in the previous section when I said that you could use that new feature to save as a different image type. Under the advanced menu, we have a few other options, including the ability to create a RAM disk. But again, this is pretty self-explanatory. So that's pretty much it for this part of the demo. But in the next section of the demo, we're actually going to switch over to a physical Windows 10 machine and we're going to play around with that nice launch VM feature, which utilizes Hyper-V. And again, that does require a physical machine to be able to do that. So let's check that out next. Okay, we are now in our Windows 10 physical machine. By the way, quick shout out to Mark at Arsenal Recon. His company not only donated the license necessary to review the software, but they also donated some hardware to the channel to help make episodes like this. As many of you know, I do most of my content creation on an iMac Pro and a MacBook Pro and run most things in either VMware Fusion or ESXi guests. While that works just fine for most lab configurations, it doesn't work when you need to test scenarios on bare metal, as in this Hyper-V virtualization test. So without further ado, let's check out just how this launch VM feature actually works. The first thing we need to do is mount the disk image that we intend to use to launch the VM. So once again, we're going to be using the same EO1 that we used in the last section of the demo. So we'll click that. And this is very important. We need to choose right temporary disk device. As the note says here, this is required for launching virtual machines. So this is what creates that right overlay. So we definitely need to choose that and then we'll click OK. And then there we go. Now this is successfully mounted. We can click the plus as always to see the metadata about that particular mounted disk image. But now we're ready to launch the VM. So let's click launch VM. So here's where the magic begins. This disk image doesn't contain a bootloader. AIM is asking us if we would like it to inject one for us. Let's go ahead and choose yes and see what happens. Next up, we get a dialog telling us that some boot parameters may need to be modified to avoid known problems. AIM is asking us if we want it to do that automatically. We'll go ahead and choose yes again. And then lastly, it's telling us that the disk is not offline, but it needs to be in order to launch the virtual machine. Let's go ahead and tell it yes, take the image offline. And there we go. So we now have a Hyper-V window on screen with the option to start the virtual machine. So let's go ahead and click start and see what happens. And as you can see, almost immediately, it appears to be attempting to boot the VM. So it looks like we're off to a good start. Now, having done this several times, I can tell you that we are going to be prompted in just a moment to set the resolution of the virtual machine. And here's that dialogue. So let's go ahead and use the slider and choose 1920 by 1080. And then we'll click connect. When we do so, you're actually going to see it lose connection to the virtual machine for a moment while the new resolution is applied. But when it comes back, we should be able to then full screen it, which we'll go ahead and do now. And we should now be full screen at that new resolution. And at this point, it looks to have successfully booted the virtual machine from the disk image. Pretty awesome. All right, so let's check out the ease of access icon in the bottom right. So I'll click on this and we get a pop-up from AIM Virtual Machine Tools asking us if we want to reset the password for the user. I'll go ahead and choose no for now. And then we get a second dialog asking us if we want to open a command prompt. So I'll say okay here. And as you can see, we get what appears to be an administrative command prompt. We are system. And if I run net local group administrators, it does indeed appear that Davis RG is a member of the local administrators group, just as advertised. 
so it seems that the AIM virtual machine tools worked perfectly. But now let's go back and try that first option to reset the password. So I'll say yes this time. And as you can see, it's changed the password to test test 1234 with a capital T for each test. So I'll say cancel for the command prompt. And now let's go ahead and type in this new password and see if it really reset it. Because I can assure you that is not what the current password is. And it appears to have worked. So AIM Virtual Machine Tools has indeed injected itself into the VM and presented itself to us via the ease of access icon on the login screen. So I did want to point out that as you can see from the bottom right in the system tray area, the network adapter for this VM is disconnected. That is a default behavior. And in fact, there are two network adapters that are both provisioned, both of which will be disconnected by default. Additionally, the virtual machine will be created with two virtual CPUs and up to half of the host's free RAM with a maximum of four gigs being allocated. And in this case, we should have four gigs. And as you can see under installed RAM, that is indeed what has been provisioned. So that wraps up this episode. I hope you've enjoyed this quick look at Arsenal Image Mounter version 3. We've seen how easy it is to mount a wide variety of image types with various options, how to mount volume shadow copies, how to convert from one image file format to another, and even how to use this powerful virtual machine launching capability. As always, thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to watch this episode. Be sure to stick around, there's plenty more content coming. And if you haven't already, please do me a favor and subscribe to the channel. I'll catch you in the next one. Take care.